Dr. Douglas Catani, who's going to be speaking on forages for salinity use. Maybe not what you think. Um, he is a perennial crop breeder agronomist at the University of Manitoba in the Department of Plant Science. Dr. Catani has worked in industry, government, and academia over the last 35 years, predominantly in forages, forage seed, and perennial grain breeding and agronomy. He has worked across Canada and the U.S. with perennials and their adaptation to end use. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's on? Good. Ah, oh. uh, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, um, forages can be used for a number of uh, reasons. Thank you. Uh, let me sure I get there. there we go. Hay is probably our, our, one of our major uses of forages in Western Canada. <clears throat> Pasture, and as Kurt just talked about, forage seed. So we, we have three options of how we can use it. What you need from it is important on how you choose which species and which blends are uh, to utilize. So when we're talking about forages and salinity, um, we're, we're generally talking about we have some that are, are tolerant of very high levels of salinity. If you, if you were here for Marla's talk, she had a graph showing some that are quite uh, susceptible and others on the far end. And many of our forages are over towards that far end. Um, compared to some of those annuals. Oh, I'll get it right. So, uh, is there a point? Oh, did I just turn that off? Yeah. Uh, again, there you have the range. If you, as I said, if you were here for Marla's, the scale along the bottom, the decisiemens, um, we have some forages that can tolerate up into that 25, 30 range. So fairly saline soils. Uh, and this, uh, similar to some of the images she sh was showing, uh, shows how it can affect an annual crop. Corn is one of the more susceptible ones, and you can see the, the crust on the soil there and the impact it's having on the corn. So in general, whether you're talking annuals or perennials, one of the main effects of Salinity on plants is it stunts its growth. Uh, again, Marla had a nice uh, slide showing barley under non-saline conditions, and as the salinity increased, even though the barley kept growing and was alive, it was stunted quite a bit. And we have to see the same thing in our perennial forages. Um, visual symptoms only show up when it reaches its, its level of intolerance. So it'll look okay, it'll look okay, and when it hits the level where it's not okay, you see the symptoms appear. So uh, sometimes it's hard to tell if they are being uh, moderately stressed. Severe stress is pretty easy to see. And to diagnose Problems in a, in a moderately saline area is pretty hard if you don't have a non-stress plant next to it or in close proximity. Okay, uh, the effect of sodium and sodium chloride is much greater on a plant than potassium or calcium chloride, which are also salts. The main reason is the toxic effect of of sodium on the plants, and I'll use alfalfa as an example because it's been the one which has had the most research carried out on it. So one of the main effects of sodium on the plant is it upsets the, the uh, levels of the cations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium in the plant. And because you get an imbalance, you start to have some issues. And one of the main issues is on photosynthesis. There's a couple of reasons. One is the toxicity, but two, the main molecule in the middle, molecule? Element in the middle of a chlorophyll molecule is magnesium. So now you're reducing the amount of magnesium which you need for chlorophyll, which you need to capture the sunlight to make the sugars to give your plant, allow your plant to grow. So sodium also has an effect on photosynthesis. And there, 
less, less photosynthesis, less carbohydrates for growth. So similar to the annual crops. Um, therefore, as your salinity level goes up, expect your forage uh, yields to go down. Uh, this is some work that's being done on alfalfa, and there is breeding taking place on alfalfa. They're hoping to get it tolerant of 16 to 18 decisiemens um, uh, tolerance levels, and the effects start in the root. Let me see if there it is. The effects start in the root in the soil. High sodium. How to get the water into the plant, and some of the, there's some methods that the plants can use, and they're listed up the side here. Once it gets into the plant, that starts going up through the stem, and you start to get the toxic effects of sodium on the plant. And once it gets up to the leaves, where photosynthesis is primarily taking place, that sodium becomes a problem. And one of the main ways that plants that are tolerant of sodium is they put it in uh, structures called vacuoles. So they take it out and try to isolate it so that it's not having effect on the whole plant. So the breeder who's working on this is in Saskatoon, and I'll have a slide near the end uh, on his program. Um, they are looking at these mechanisms, trying to increase them in the, in the crop so that they can uh, manage sodium and plant this into more saline areas throughout predominantly Saskatchewan and Alberta, but also into Manitoba. As mentioned earlier, we do have saline areas in Western Canada and in Manitoba. They occur in some local areas. In Winnipeg, over towards the airport, we have a couple of saline areas and we can find highly saline tolerant plants. And there are a number of species that have developed uh, under these conditions, and when salinity moves into your areas, some of these plants end up being the problem species that you find. Um, so they're problematic. This is a native plant in Winnipeg. Uh, it's right next to a bus stop, so in the winter they pour literally a ton of salt in those areas because they don't like hitting the people standing at the bus stop, primarily. But you can see that this species grows right to the curb. It's a warm season grass. It delays growth in the spring when you're splashing all that water back up onto plants trying to grow. Grows a little later, shuts down early in the fall. It's a great boulevard grass, to be honest, if you're going to be putting salt on the road. So this is one that uh, you can find it throughout Winnipeg, generally growing where they've spread salt on the roads. It's native to most of North America, so we're, it's not just here, it's all around. You'll find it almost everywhere, except for a little bit there in the, one of the river valleys, I guess, through Missouri River Valley, maybe? No, in the US. Um, this plant has been used by indigenous peoples as a spice. It has those vacuoles where the salt crystals are, so they used to dry them rub out so that they get the salt crystals and use it as a, as a flavoring. And there, I've never tried this, so I have no idea. Salt tastes like a salty dill pickle. If you like dill pickles, maybe this is a spice for you. Um, also used as a medicine. So these plants have had, have use uh, for uh, health, food, or whatever, also forage. Uh, Here's the other one that is quite problematic in our province when we have salinity and encroaching salinity, and that's foxtail barley. This is a perennial ryegrass seed production field. If you notice, Kurt did not mention perennial ryegrass talking about salinity. It does not like it. This is the good half of the field. You should see the bad half. That was almost complete foxtail barley, and salinity was a major portion of the reason for that being there. It's native to our area, it's all around, and if you begin to see it starting to pop up, test, test for salinity. Okay. 
Now, the plants that are truly saline that evolved under saline conditions, uh, you'll notice there's two sets of lines on those graphs. One goes down as salinity goes up. The other either is level or slightly goes up as salinity goes up. These species are able to be as productive under saline conditions as they are under good soil conditions. Or in other words, they aren't very good under good soil conditions. They grow very well comparatively under high saline conditions. So if you look there, we've got alfalfa. As salinity goes up, its production will go down. And there's the salt grass I was talking about, plus Bermuda grass as you go into warmer areas of the North American continent. So, as I said earlier, for most of our crop species, whether they're annuals or perennials, as salinity increases, we begin to lose productivity. Don't expect to get 10 tons per hectare or uh, 10,000 pounds per acre of alfalfa off of a highly saline field. It will drop, but it will also be relatively higher quality alfalfa than the ones at the high uh, yield levels because most of your fiber in your alfalfa is in those stems. So even though it's shorter, you tend to have a higher protein content in your forage. So how do we choose which forages to use in our region? The first thing is it's got to be able to survive winter. Um, some people this week are wondering why they're here trying to survive winter. Plants can't get up and go to Mexico for a couple of weeks or whatever. Can't even go out to curl on Friday nights or Thursday nights. They're stuck where you planted them. So they need to survive in our growth environment. Second, what are you going to use it for? And where are you going to plant it in your landscape? Because those will affect which ones you choose. And in some species, uh, AC saltlander was one of the wheat grasses that Kurt put up on his um, uh, slides. Has been bred for uh, salinity tolerance. And it's one of these species that doesn't produce high yields at ideal soil conditions, but maintains that yield as salinity goes up. So if you know you have a saline area, something like AC saltlander is a good choice to put into those areas. Uh, some of the grasses he mentioned can be problematic. Uh, the tall fescues, uh, we do have some now that are getting better, and intermediate wheat grasses is again, again, which say poor longevity. Uh, the alcyke and red clovers can be problematic depending on the winter. Um, we had a fairly open winter this year until recently, and I would expect red clover would be relatively hard hit. Alcyke should be better, but red clover would be, would be the hardest hit of any of these on this list. And then we talk about poor winter tolerance. Uh, we are getting better with, uh, let me see, I should advance that. Intermediate, we have made strides through breeding. Orchard and tall fescue, we have made some uh, strides again. We're now looking at five to six years survival as opposed to the two to three we had initially. So we, they're slowly getting up there. So how long are you going to have this in uh, there as well? Some of the high fall dormancy alfalfas can be problematic for um, winter tolerance. If you're going to be grazing it, the non-bloat legumes, sane foins, sacer milk veg, birds for trefoil, out of those three, uh, we'll, go we'll go through in the next slides to show how they are for salinity tolerance. Uh, most of the grasses don't cause bloat except for uh, perennial ryegrass can be problematic, but it doesn't survive very well here, so we put very little of that in any of our mixes. Uh, grazing tolerance. If you're going to be grazing it, take this into consideration. Again, we have things, um, bluegrasses, uh, Russian wild rye, Altai wild rye, crested wheatgrass. These are some of the grasses that have some or quite a bit of salinity tolerance and are good for grazing. The Russian wild rye and the crested wheatgrass have early spring growth. So if you want to be grazing something for three to four weeks in the spring, these might be the ones you want to put in. 
The added advantage is that Russian wild rye, uh, Altai wild rye, and crested to a lesser extent do have salinity tolerance. On the uh, legume side, you can see there that uh, birds with trefoil, Cicer milkfetch, and creeping rooted alfalfas. Uh, unfortunately, the work so far has mainly been with bunch type alfalfas for salinity tolerance. Um, there is work going on right now trying to select uh, for salinity tolerant alfalfas. Hopefully some of them will be the, that will come out of the program will be creeping rooted. Uh, poor establishment, and again, uh, I know Kurt talked uh, about how to grow for forage seed production. We have the same poor establishment issues for forage production. Um, again, Unfortunately, oh, sorry, the one that it says it's on, this one here, the Cicer milk vetch, is probably our best legume for salinity. If you plant it this year, in 2024, come back in 2026 and see if it's there. You will not see much of it before then. If any of you have visited the MBFI farm, the old Ag Canada farm up on the east side of town, they put a pasture in there might have been Paul McKay here, one of those Ag Canada researchers from like 35 years ago, 30 years ago. The Cicer milk vetch is doing fantastic in those pastures. Getting it established is the problem, but it will persist, and it actually doesn't mind our area uh, once, it's once it's established. And that's always the, the critical factor in these. Um, Tolerant of flooding or poor drainage. Generally, the ones that are intolerant of flooding, or sorry, are tolerant of flooding, do very poor under saline conditions. I, mainly because they're, they grow in riparian areas along rivers where salinity hasn't been an issue. The next one is probably the one you want to hear the most about is the... Uh, Salinity tolerance. The wheat grasses are generally pretty good. AC salt lander is a slender wheat grass. Uh, the Russian wild rye and the Altai wild rye are extremely salt tolerant. They are the gold level of our forages for salinity tolerance. Getting them established, they're probably down about here on the list. They are very poor seedling establishers. So. How do you get them into your, into your area is probably, the big, uh, is probably the critical factor in there. When they grow, as I was saying, this is a general, generality. Every year it can be different. But you can see there are three that are growing relatively early in the spring. The crested wheat, the Russian wild rye, and the meadow brome are almost a month ahead of everything else. So when that snow melts, they jump. If it melts in March, they begin their growth. If it melts in the first week of May, like it has a couple of the last year, everything begins to grow. It's those early parts of the season that these have a great benefit. And maybe with our variable weather, if we get better weather in the spring, we'll see a greater impact on the yield of some of these uh, grasses and legumes. But those, if you're looking at grazing and you need something for a special time of year, these are some things to consider. And if it's on saline land, they'll probably produce as much on good land, the Alsace, not the Alsace, the Altai wild rye and the Russian wild rye. They'll be as almost productive on the saline soil as they will on the normal soil. So keep that in mind when you're looking at which to plant. Again, if we're talking about the uh, Russian wild rye and the Altai wild rye, they're up in this 16 range where they start to see a little bit of slowdown in productivity, whereas alfalfa and many of the other grasses, it's that 12 to 16 range where they will drop off. Even the ones that are saline tolerant will begin to drop off. Here's a study out of, uh, well, this one's out of Utah, where 
If you wanted to talk about salt in North America, the Great Salt Lake and all of those salt flats in those areas, they did some work and they found that foxtail barley and Altai wild rye had their best, gave them their best productivity under high saline conditions. Tall wheatgrass, creeping foxtails, orchard grass, and then some of our good flood tolerant grasses, Timothy, reed canary, and actually orchard grass as well, not doing too well under saline conditions. This is relatively, this is one of the more recent tests that have been run comparing salinity tolerances in our forages. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of work done in Canada over the last few decades, um, but it is starting to take off again uh, over the last five or six years. And I'll show you something on that. So foxtail barley, this is establishment or emergence of the plants under salinity. You can see that, and these are four salt tolerant alfalfa varieties. They're not adapted to our area, but they are four salt tolerant uh, varieties. And you can see once it's that 16 level, you begin to see establishment issues and then problems uh, thereafter. Um, relative biomass productivity of the same varieties. Again, once you hit, go from 12 to 16, you begin to see a drop. And then as you head up to 25, uh, a greater drop. So you can select for uh, saline tolerance and relatively good productivity. It's just how well uh, they react to the growth environment. Um, other things to keep in mind when seeding perennial forages, we're always seeding mixtures. We're rarely seeding a single uh, crop. If you looked at Kurt's list on his thing, I think he had nine or 10 species in his mix for saline areas. You don't need that many, but you will be putting in a number. You usually like a legume in a grass, legume to up your protein, grass usually to uh, give you a little more biomass. Uh, the mixtures always, I shouldn't say always, but generally give you most, um, your highest yields. Almost all of these are outcrossing species. If you get a, one of your canola hybrids and take one seed, it's the same theoretically, genetically to all your other seeds in your, in your uh, bag or your bin or your hopper. Wheat, same thing as an inbred line. We cannot make any, well, that's not true. All but two species of our perennials, we cannot make them self or produce seed that is genetically similar to the parent. It always has to get pollen from somewhere else. And because of that, we deal with populations and within your populations, you're going to have variation. So you may have a few alfalfa, uh, of, say, uh, if you have a, a saline tolerant alfalfa, you may have a few plants die, but the population in general has good tolerance. Just don't look at one plant and make a decision. Make sure you look at the whole area. Um, they need to be able to survive in, in Western Canada. Before 1990, uh, when Peter Jones, who was the forage a uh, specialist out of Toulon, Manitoba, retired and took his collection of plants he'd been making over the last 20 years to BC with them and bred Courtney tall fescue and Arctic uh, orchard grass. We didn't have either of those species that would survive more than three years there. We now have some that'll survive quite well. And if you remember the list of salinity tolerance, Courtney tall fescue was on that list. So. Uh, we, we can make um, progress, and there's two good examples. Each year, likely, and will be different. We don't know if the snow is going to melt on and see crocuses on March 30th, or some years it's May 15th. We don't have an idea, and every year is going to be different, and the, the interaction of the years, and whether it's wet, dry, hot, cold, and the combination of all those are going to have differential effects. So it's hard to predict. Well, I'm not going to predict anything about this upcoming year. Thankfully, we got snow protecting the crowns of most of our perennials. I think most of them will come through the winter without much issue. But other than that, I'm not making any predictions. Um, in a good year, once established, most of our perennials, uh, this is intermediate wheatgrass taken, I think it was June the 4th that year. They're good in the spring. They come out of winter 
quite um, d uh, vigorous, and those are different varieties in this test, but you can see that all of them would outcompete almost any annual weed you would have once established. Getting them established can be the trick. Uh, once established, though, they are quite competitive, and usually the only weeds you'll end up with are perennial weeds. Oh, wrong one. Um, there are two things I'm going to talk about, seedling vigor. So this is seedling competitiveness. We've got alfalfa, sweet clover, red clover, ryegrass, intermediate. In the moderate, we have the next ones, including tall fescue. And in the last one, we have uh, reed canary, mainly the small seeded species. We'd have to throw Cicer milk vetch into that group. We've tried to grow it. Uh, the first year, it looks like very little. In the second year, we saw some, but our third year, it actually yielded as much as our alfalfa. So it can do quite well. So the larger the seed, the better the vigor. That Hopefully that makes sense. Um, you have the ability to emerge, and then how well do they grow once they emerge? And you can see we have some species like uh, Timothy and Birdsfoot Trefoil are these two lower ones. This is uh, alfalfa, and that's intermediate wheatgrass. This is how long they've been emerged from the soil, and the older they get, hopefully they're growing, and some of them, intermediate wheatgrass is actually quite vigorous and can be established on seeding alone, and even when we've established it uh, under, underneath wheat, again, at about two-thirds the normal seeding rate for wheat, we haven't seen an impact on the yield of the intermediate the following year. So, Relative competitiveness is quite important within these. Um, there is selection for salinity tolerance in Western Canada. I was asked by Marla, is the salt lab still working in Swift Current? They are the ones running these. And I, I work with uh, Bill on intermediate, but Bill Billiga too at the University of Manitoba, not Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Sean Aslan with AAFC and Swift Current. He's uh, the one running the, uh, the lab there, are doing work on salinity tolerance in the forages, and hopefully we'll have some new varieties. It'll probably be another eight to 10 years before we see varieties, but they are being selected and being tested uh, as we're going along. Um, this is uh, the intermediate wheat grasses at 16 decisiemens. This is AC Saltlander, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. This is one of the new accessions that they found from, I think, the Turkey area or up in the mountains in Turkey. And these are other ones that uh, have done relatively well at 12 and 14, but are showing some um, difficulties at 16 growing. So it's that 12 to 14 range, depending on the species. Once you hit 16, you can pick out the good ones quite easily. And AC Saltlander, that's that slender wheatgrass that we talked about earlier, is probably the best uh, for that. The next steps, they're doing taking the intermediate wheatgrass to the field. Under saline, they've got some saline areas in their field of swift current, and they'll make selections for uh, breeding uh, purposes there. So, in my last slide, I hope, I think, uh, perennial forages species, there are some that can persist, and just like annual crops, they're not all created equal. Some will die as soon as you go near them. Others will do very well until you hit quite high levels of salinity. Adapted cultivars for the high salinity tolerance are available in, in alfalfa. I think Halo out of Lethbridge is the current um, saline tolerant alfalfa that we have. Uh, as I said, AC Saltlander and some of the other species, the Russian wild rye and Altai wild rye have some good uh, germplasm out there. <sighs> Establishment of the tolerant species and cultivars is going to be the biggest challenge. As salinity goes up, the ability to establish drops. So depending on where you are in the cycle, I don't know if you remember Marlis, if you're here from Marlis, every, the, the salinity, depending on the moisture and the water use, 
changes from year to year. You may have years where it's very easy to establish and other years where you won't be able to. So that's all uh, relative to the growth environment and the year. And productivity, once you hit that 12 to, to 16 range, can drop off, especially in the ones we are breeding. Uh, if I went back to that slide of I showed of alfalfa and all the ways it can uh, help avoid uh, salinity and sodium toxicity, the ones that um, evolved here in Western Canada under saline conditions have most of those already in it. That's why they just yield the same all the way along. So they've got this built in uh, from, uh, when did the last glacier leave here? 20,000 years ago? So over the last 20,000 years, these developed these, these capacities. And that should be it. Well, thank you. All seven of them. <laughs> sure. Great. Thank you, Dr. Katani. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, right up there. Well, again, if you heard Marla's talk, she said it's a water problem. If you looked at the, the ones, uh, uh, the Altai, uh, Russian wild rye and the crested wheat, they're growing for however long the snow's off the ground. Your wheat is in for 95, 96 days maybe, your canola, a little less maybe, and then what's on the land? Nothing. These are using water, transpiring water, throughout the entirety of the, of the year where we don't have snow. Um, at one and a half degrees Celsius, our cool season grasses, uh, the one they've worked on uh, is intermediate wheatgrass, at one and a half degrees Celsius, it's at about 15 to 20 percent peak photosynthesis. So it's best photosynthesis at whatever temperature. At one and a half degrees Celsius, they're at 15 percent of the peak. So they are growing, they are using water, and they help manage water in, in the environment. So that's one way they can help with the salinity problem, by using the water so there's not as much moving around and, and causing issues. Uh, here? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's possibly an issue, but uh, that's hard to c comment on. You should be getting a seed test certificate. Look at it if there's downy brome on it. Deal with somebody you trust. <laughs> I'm not any seed company. I can tell one person. He says this is the greatest. This is the greatest. The, this this one will say that guy's a crook and that guy's a crook. I want nothing to do with that. If Find somebody you trust. Get your seed test certificate. If there's any downy brome in it, it's got to, it has to be listed. And so if you plant it and you've got downy brome in there, there's an issue. But yeah, it can be quite problematic as well. I've, I've talked to the people in Saskatchewan. They have areas where it's been in quite a while. It's in the Swift Current area. Uh, they, they have uh, on the farm there, they, they have a patch of it. I guess they probably have the breeder's block of it. And it has persisted. Uh, the person I know who's there now has only been there six years, but it was there before he got there, and it's still there now. So. Nobody looks usually after four or five years at most things, it seems. Uh, 
Actually, uh, yes, but not in the way you're thinking of it. They're actually trying to cross it with barley to make a perennial barley. To be honest, that's what, that's, and if you can get the perennial barley, then maybe it'll choke out the foxtail barley. Uh, no, they haven't done much. One of the big issues with foxtail barley is the, when it heads out, and it heads out, can head out quite low. You know, if you graze it, it can head out low, below, uh, just above where they've grazed. And if those seeds get in, they can be quite irritating to the animal and be problematic. Uh, I got called out about 2018, so that's what, six years ago. Uh, to the dog training park north of Winnipeg, up north of Balmoral. They had foxtail barley and they're having the Canadian championships of bird dogs and they're trying to get rid of the foxtail barley because as the dogs ran through it, they were inhaling it and causing issues with that. So it is a tricky one to work with. But no one that I know of has tried to make it better um, as yet. It depends on the species. Uh, Alcite clover, I don't know if you've ever worked with it. It's like dust. It's ridiculous how small it is. Um, Timothy, two million seeds per pound. Um, alfalfa, probably 500,000 seeds per pound. So depending on the species, you could up it, but depending on how you're trying to grow, what you're trying to grow it for, it'll have a, an effect. Usually in, the, in hay production, you can get away with a little higher seeding rate than for pasture. You want the pasture plants to develop better, especially alfalfa, because you want that crown to be pulled back down below the surface so that the, it'll survive the winter. So if, if they're competing too much and going up, you can have an issue with it. Alfalfa is probably the, the, the worst one for that. But yeah, if you're having, especially at the high salinity end, you might want to up your rates. If you're only seeing 30% emergence, double your rates, hopefully you'd see 60. But that can be quite expensive. <laughs>